I'm very happy to see you here at this beautiful place. I think we're very fortunate that we have been welcomed as a group into this lovely center. It is, uh, in all respects, a perfect place to practice. And uh, that's a support system. To have good practice, of course, we have to do it ourselves. But not only is the Dhamma Hall beautiful and imbued with long-time practice, the surroundings are also very beautiful. So I hope that all of you will have a very satisfactory and a very beneficial course. The teacher can do nothing other than point out the direction. That's all. There's nothing else to be done. And if you take the pointer and wander in that direction, you're bound to get somewhere. If the pointer is obscure or if you think you've been pointed somewhere else, well, it's everybody's own wish what happens. Buddha said of himself that he is only the shower of the way. Well, what to say about a, a teacher two and a half thousand years later? I mean, if, you, if the Buddha was only a shower of the way, what could be happening now? Not even a shower of the way, just a pointer like with a pointing stick. But one thing for sure, in my experience of teaching, that those people who actually, without any, the, without any difficulty, follow the instructions, and the difficulties are in the mind because of skeptical doubt and having heard other things and so forth, actually follow the instructions, have very beneficial results. It's been the experience over and over again. So I hope that you will have very beneficial results. <laughs> With that sentence, I have to add, don't look for results. Just do it. <laughs> it's an important injunction. Don't look for anything, just do it. There are a number of practical things which have come to my mind and I haven't got a clue whether they have already been said. So if they have, and I'm doubling up, you have to forgive me. But um, they have come to my mind as being fairly important. If you want to order tapes, copies of the tape that we are taping here, of the uh, discourses, of the talks, do it as quickly as you can. Write it down, there are lists hanging out there where you can put your name down and which tape number you want. There's also a piece of paper there giving the title of each day's tape. Do it as quickly as possible because the tapes are going to be done while you're here so that you can take them home with you. Saves a lot of postage and a lot of rummaging around. And so the quicker you do it, the easier it is to copy them. So they're hanging out there, the sheets, put your name in, and then the sheet with the titles of the tapes. And the second thing, which I dare say has been mentioned, but I'll mention it again, is that every day, one hour after lunch, at the uh, surface service time after lunch, uh, Hetty will be out there at the book table and you can purchase books and if you must read read those <laughs> it's uh, better not take them home but if the mind says oh, this is really too much I need to have a look at what it says in there well then use those this brings me to a very important point 
for this retreat, as you probably all know, or practically all of you, we're going to be on Noble Silence. This is a very important aspect of an intensive meditation retreat. Now we've come together for a certain purpose, and I dare say the purpose is to have the meditation improve, um, get more anchored, have, bring peacefulness, bring insight. All of these need to be reinforced with what we're doing during the day, even when we're not sitting in meditation. And the first thing that is a support system is the noble silence, not to talk to each other. When we talk to each other, we get personal opinions. And they may be favorable or unfavorable, it doesn't matter, they're personal opinions. The very first discourse in the Diganikaya, the collection of long discourses, is called the Brahma Jala Sutta, and it lists 62 views and opinions that mankind has, which are, so to say, a collection of all the views we have. And the Buddha says they're all wrong, each one. It doesn't matter what they're all about. And they're wrong because they're coming from a projection of me. And the less we project out, the less we have to deal with that. So when we talk to each other, it's a going out. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to go in, inside of ourselves. And if we actually do and get the meditation to be um, peaceful and quiet, we will find inside of ourselves everything we've ever been looking for. We find the jewel that is hidden beneath all our thoughts, all our reactions, all our emotions. And that jewel is utterly joyful, utterly peaceful. But we've got to become quiet. And the outer quietness, the non-talking, it's only the beginning. It's only a support system so that the inner quiet can happen. The whole place is a support system. The, uh, the kind of hole, the, um, the food, the people who live here, everything is a support. This group supports each other. But the main work each one has to do for him or herself. Noble silence doesn't mean that we can't ask questions. You have already, I'm sure, been told that there is a little bowl outside, pieces of paper and pens, and you can write down questions, and every evening we're going to have a question and answer session. And mainly, I'm going to use those, sometimes there are so many that I can't possibly use them all. So mainly, I will use those questions that are of interest to everyone. Even if they concern a personal problem, it may be of interest to everyone. It needs to be something that concerns practice and meditation. It needs to be something that concerns the Buddhist teaching and not some just um, thought of idea which has to do with other things other than what we're doing here. I'm saying that from long years of experience. So if your questions have anything to do with anything that we're doing here, I'm certain to answer them. I try my very best that uh, you will find uh, some assistance in the answer. That's one thing. You're all going to have interviews. And uh, we have sheets hanging out there, same place where the tape orders are hanging. And you will find your name on one of those sheets. Now, obviously, not everybody can have an interview the first day. So what is happening is that there are Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, and 
everybody is getting an interview during those days. And then there are empty places. And so then you can put your name in. But please, first, put your name in once. And then see whether there are more empty places. And then you can put it in again. But don't do what sometimes is being done. Put your name in every day. Uh, wait to see whether there's more empty spots. And you don't have to go back to the same um, interview partner that you had the first time. You can choose another one. We have Lee and Kay uh, as your interview partners. And these interviews are designed for discussing your own meditation practice. And both of these, Lee and Kay, are long-time practitioners and are able to help you with your meditation practice. So if you want to go back to the same one another time, you put your name in there. If you want to try the other one, get another opinion, that's fine. Go to the other one. Uh, either way is fine. So you have opportunities to discuss whatever seems important to you. So we have questions and answers and we have interviews. I also have some interviews, but not as many, um, because I find it a rather tiring. One of the things which I'd like to talk about tonight are the immediate benefits of meditation, which are important to those of you who have not meditated for very long yet or have not become concentrated. The immediate benefits of meditation which happen to everyone when they sit down. One doesn't even have to be concentrated. Now I think that's a great consolation, isn't it? That one doesn't even have to be concentrated in order to get benefits of meditation. And if more people knew that, less people would stop meditating. Because obviously it's frustrating when one tries to concentrate and it doesn't happen and one does it again and again and apparently nothing happens but it's not true something always happens but it's very helpful I think to know that something always happens so we're going to look at the immediate benefits of meditation the first immediate benefit of meditation is making good karma. And I don't know whether this is stressed enough how important it is to make good karma. It may be just one of those things or sentences that are taken for granted. And we take so many things for granted which we should look at in a far more analytical way. Making good karma means that we have a support system for our lives. And that support system is neither material nor financial, not dependent on other people, it's not dependent on anything outside of us, it's strictly dependent on what we do. Karma, literally translated, means action. But the Buddha said, karma, O oh monks, I declare, is intention. So when you sit down with the intention to meditate, that is good karma. And you mel the more good karma we make, the easier it becomes to meditate. That's why it's so important to have patience with oneself in the meditation and perseverance. Patience, perseverance, and endurance. Without those three wonderful uh, qualities, it doesn't happen. But if we know that every time we sit down with that intention, that we are accumulating good karma, it may help us to keep that perseverance going. No matter what happens, 
in the meditation, the intention has been there. So that's the first benefit. The second benefit is that it is an immediate antidote for our third hindrance. We've got five. The third one is sloth and torpor, it's usually called. Laziness of the mind, one could say. Lassitude of the mind, lethargy. <laughs> it's also disinterest, but it's also um, sort of a projection. Maybe I can do it later. <coughs> Maybe I don't have to bother. The mind that likes to fantasize, the mind that likes to dream up things but never follow through when nothing happens so the mind that has sloth and torpor is a mind that the Buddha described as being in prison we have imprisoned it ourselves but we've got the key so every time we sit down to meditate with the intention to meditate and then put our attention on the meditation subject that sloth and torpor is at that moment totally negated the mind is trying to focus it's not saying I'll do it tomorrow I'll do it when I'm not so busy I'll do it when I'm retired I'll do it uh, another day when it's not so hot or so cold. It's doing it then and there. It's right there. So this is the immediacy of the antidote against that particular hindrance. That particular hindrance is not so much recognized. It's easy to recognize when one is angry. It's not quite as easy to recognize when one has a craving. It's not quite as easy as anger, but it's also recognizable. And those are the first two. But the third one, the mind that just doesn't want to really focus and get going, it's not so easy to know. And it's a big hindrance. A big hindrance in daily life and of course in meditation so we have an immediate benefit by trying to focus immediately right then and there even though that the focus doesn't remain and doesn't matter we have to do it over and over again that doing over and over again is the antidote over and over again and it doesn't matter how often we have to go back to the breath because we've lost the concentration. Every time we do, it's working against that laziness of the mind. So these are two traditional benefits, but we have more than that. Because we're going to label the content of our thought, that what is the disturbing thought that disturbs our meditation. We learn an enormous lot about ourselves. That labeling is when there's no concentration. The most important thing to do. I'll explain the labeling afterwards. But what it does is, the first thing it does is, it shows us our thought patterns. Everybody has patterns of thoughts that recur over and over again. And because they do, we have reactions to them over and over again. And we find ourselves, actually, if we know about it, in a sort of... Um, circular movement of the mind we think a certain way we react a certain way and because we react we have 
a certain emotion. And as we have a certain emotion, we think a certain way, we react a certain way, and have that emotion again. It's like a record player that has gone out of hand and keeps turning and turning and turning. Recognizing the thought pattern is a very important help, not just for meditation, but for our daily lives. Because we will see when we sit quietly and nobody's doing anything except we are having thought patterns that we are making them ourselves. There is nobody that has done anything to us or about us. We're doing it ourselves. There are no triggers. It's all being triggered within. Now when we have seen that, we will also recognize that we don't have to believe those thought patterns. They are just there. We don't have to do something about every single thought we think. We don't have to react to if we don't like something. We don't have to get irritated by it. We don't have to try and change it. It's just a thought. If we want something, we don't have to run after it. It's just a thought. And seeing that, knowing that in everyday life, because we have to transfer that labeling into everyday life, otherwise we can't have a spiritual path, is an enormous change from ordinary, everyday kind of mentality. The third thing that we recognize because of labeling we recognize that every thought that has arisen disappears and it has no life of its own unless we imbue it with energy no need to it just comes and it goes so we have a personal experience of impermanence in our thoughts and we have a personal experience of our patterns, thought patterns, and we have a personal experience of the fact that we don't have to do anything about them. They're just coming and going. Now these are three aspects of our labeling which help us. But there's, there are more immediate benefits than that. The next benefit that we get is that we got to be here now and that is mindfulness and if we don't have it we'll never meditate now some people have natural mindfulness some people have none whatsoever most people have some but it's not enough for meditation one has to cultivate it one has to cultivate being in this moment. Now, if we ever watch our breath and become concentrated on even one breath, just one, we have been in that one moment. It's totally different from letting the mind roam and fantasize and think up ideas. We cannot watch a breath which is gone. It's gone. We can't become concentrated. We can't become concentrated on a breath that hasn't happened yet. It's obvious, isn't it? So we've got to watch the breath which is now, this moment. And then we're actually in this moment. And the question is often asked, what is mindfulness? People think they know. But if they did, they'd practice it. And since they don't, one can assume that they don't know. That's mindfulness. Being nowhere else except with this one breath. Because there's nothing else happening. That's it. We're sitting there and we're breathing. And that's it. And of course, unfortunately, we're also thinking. But we have already dealt with that. We're going to label that. 
and we're going to find out what all this thinking is about. And when we find out what it's all about, we will realize it's all about the world, the world we live in, the things we did before we came, the things we're going to do when we leave, the things that we like about the present moment and that we dislike about the present moment. All sorts of ideas and reactions have nothing to do with the spiritual path. And even if we think about anything in the Dhamma, it's still a thought. So if we actually on one breath only, we have experienced mindfulness. Having experienced that, we are concerned with purification. Now, purification of heart and mind is the essence of spiritual living. Spirituality is not practiced on a pillow. Sitting on the pillow is a means towards spirituality. Spirituality is practiced in everyday life. And purification of heart and mind is the essence. And if that doesn't happen, we're kidding ourselves. And we're extremely good at that. We all kid ourselves about a lot of things. So why shouldn't we kid ourselves about this? If we don't purify, nothing is happening. And that purification becomes obvious to ourselves quite easily and also to our surroundings, the people around us. It isn't something that one talks about. If one talks about it, it isn't happening. It's a change in one's inner being. The change is like having cleaned up a house in which we live which hasn't had a good spring cleaning. And as we rub away at the spots, as we pick up the mess, as we wash everything inside, it becomes a different <coughs> feeling where we are in that house. That different feeling where we live within ourselves has to arise from meditation. If it doesn't, we're not meditating. It's so simple and yet we often don't see it. The Buddhist teachings are extremely simple. But sometimes because they're so simple we find it hard to actually do it. The purification of heart and mind is something that we will talk about more. But here, we will just relate it and refer to it with the aspect of mindfulness. One single moment of mindfulness, being totally in this moment, totally observant of this one breath, is one single moment of, con of concentration and therefore one single moment of purification. So one single moment of concentration of being right here and nowhere else with that which we have intended to do is one moment of purifying. Why is that so? Because at that time when we concentrate when we are utterly mindful of that what we're doing, it's impossible to be hateful, angry, irritated, or craving. Those two aspects of ourselves, the wanting and the not wanting, cannot happen at the same time that we are actually in the moment. And therefore, this purification the more we meditate, the more it happens. It just keeps on accumulating. And we need to practice mindfulness outside of the sitting practice. If we don't, 
the sitting practice will not be successful. There are so many obstacles to successful practice, but there are also so many support systems that we should, if we can bring ourselves to do it, take every support system there is and use it so that all the obstacles fall by the wayside. Because meditation, as we will talk about it in succeeding, the succeeding days, is not just watching the breath. Meditation, watching the breath, is a method. Meditation starts when the method stops. And as the method stops, then we know ourselves inside. So we have to first take every step to get there. Mindfulness outside of the sitting practice. When we label the thoughts that are disturbing the meditation, the thoughts that uh, roam into the world, that giving a label is the fourth foundation of mindfulness. Most of you I've heard something about the foundations of mindfulness, I dare say. I'm just taking it for granted right now that most of you know that there are four. Four foundations, four possibilities to be mindful. We're starting out with the fourth one. The content of the thought, giving it a label. The content of the thought, labeling it means that we realize this is future, this is past, this is unnecessary, this is hoping, wishing, dreaming, fantasizing, this is remembering, this is um, objecting, getting irritated, this is um, nonsense, that's a good one. If one can be honest enough to oneself, nobody else needs to know about that. But uh, if we tell ourselves that, it's a good one. Because we can see all this stuff that comes up. It's like in a dream. Things come up that we haven't thought about in years and couldn't possibly have any significance. It's long gone. So we can label nonsense. We can label later. We can label not necessary. We can use all sorts of labels. We don't have to label um, this is home, this is work. It's much better to label it in the way that I've just described. Most of it will be either future or past. It's hardly anything that isn't that. Could hardly be anything that isn't either future or past. Which immediately brings to mind, I'm not here now. Where am I? That's a good question too. What am I doing with my mind? Why is it out there? Why isn't it here where I want it to be? These are all labels, all concerning the content of the thought. Now, if we do that in the meditation, which we will do in a few moments, that has to continue outside of meditation. It's just one of the foundations. And you will notice then that it's becoming much easier to get back to that which is really important. Now, when we meditate and we have labeled, we learn that the observer of the thought is no longer the thinker. And so, the thought dissolves. And we can go back to the um, observance of the breath. So what we're doing is we're substituting the uh, thought with the attention on the breath. Now, outside of meditation, and this we do with every thought, be it ever so kind and nice, because we want to meditate. We're not trying to be kind and nice while we're meditating, we're trying to meditate. But when we're doing this outside of meditation, we can actually see whether the content of the thought is wholesome or unwholesome. And if it's unwholesome, we substitute 
we are so wholesome one. And if we practice this here in the meditation, outside of meditation, we will be able to practice it in daily life. And as we do that in daily life, our whole life changes. It can't help but change. Because the only thing that makes us unhappy are our own, our own unwholesome thoughts. Nobody else can make us unhappy. All we can do is react. And if we don't, there's no need to be unhappy. So if we really want to have a quality of life which is far removed from the ordinary, what I call marketplace mentality, and has a spiritual quality at all times, we need to know what we're thinking and be able to substitute the unwholesome with the wholesome. So you can see that you have an immediate benefit from the most unconcentrated meditation, no matter how much you think, if you label it and learn the labeling and thereby learn the substitution, you have a great advantage. The whole inner being in daily life changes, where eventually you can rely on your thoughts and no longer be bothered by them. Most people are really and truly bothered by their thinking and some are so bothered by them that they become quite um, excited and uh, sometimes depressed by them. No need to if we are able to substitute. So substitution is the one important matter to take into daily life and you have to practice it outside of the meditation in the hall otherwise we can't take it with us it's something that we learn and it becomes habitual mindfulness as the first foundation is mindfulness of the body and it is being practiced as we watch the breath. Breath is body. And as we watch the breath, as it goes in and out, we are concerned with one part of our body. Outside of meditation, use that mindfulness as the main aspect of mindfulness. What one is doing with the body. We know when we get up, we know when we sit down. We know how we sit. We know when we put our shoes on, when we take them off. We know every step we take from the seat to the door. We know every step we take from the door to the dining hall. We know when we sit down. We know that we pull out the chair, that we sit down when we pull in the chair. Most people can't be bothered be bothered. Do it. It's the only way you'll ever get the meditation to the point where you would like to have it, even if you don't know where you'd like to have it. But I can assure you, without that, it doesn't work. You can't expect the mind to do anything it wants, as it usually does, then come in here, sit down, tell it to concentrate and it will do it. How can it do a thing like that? if it's been playing around all the time in between meditations and then it's supposed to sit down here and get concentrated it's asking the impossible and most people do ask the impossible and therefore they don't get possible results from it so watch every step the Buddha said mindfulness of the body is the opening to the deathless We'll talk about what the deathless means at a later date. It also means not being born, of course. But we don't want to go into that now. It, without mindfulness of the body, he also said, we won't be able to recognize 
who and what we are. Now, eating is a very, very um, good opportunity for mindfulness. It takes a spoon, put it in, dish it out on the plate, and take the fork, stick it in the mouth, and we chew, taste, swallow. Watch it at the next meal and see whether you actually chew, taste, and swallow, or whether the mind is making up all sorts of stories. The stories are, who is that in the green sweater? I think I've seen that person before. That's funny, looks familiar. Well, maybe I haven't seen him. Maybe all these other people I haven't seen before. And uh, that's strange. Why didn't my friends come? They should have come too. I asked them to come. Well, that's the matter with friends. And the mind just goes on and on and on and on. And all the time you're chewing, tasting, swallowing. And there can be another story going on. It's another storyline. Oh, this tastes good. I must get the recipe for that. Well, I'm not supposed to talk. Or maybe I can write a little note about the recipe. And uh, I do like this kind of food. I should really cook more of that. And <laughs> it's no end to it. The mind, we call the mind a magician. It can do anything. The, the magician can do things which look so believable that we have been believing it for decades already. But this time, we're not going to. We're going to tell it to stop. We're going to say to the mind, look, we're here for a certain purpose. We're here to get inside of ourselves. And that purpose is not accomplished if you do all these funny things you always do. So please be concentrated on eating. And then maybe the mind will do it. And every time you notice that you're not concentrated on what's happening, then you're mindful again. Only when we don't notice it, we have lost mindfulness completely. So watch it, how often you notice it, and how often you realize that you have to get back to mindfulness. So the body is the first priority of mindfulness. However, if thoughts arise which are taking you away from the mindfulness of the body, then we do what I've described as labeling and substituting. And what we substitute with when it's unwholesome, with a wholesome thought, we can also, and it is even um, very, very beneficial, to substitute any thought with attention on the body on what we're doing. So you have two choices. If the thoughts that arise are taking you away from the mindfulness of the body and you realize the thought is unwholesome, you substitute with a wholesome one. And if you realize the thought is quite wholesome, you substitute with the attention on the body. And the same applies to everyday life. There are many occasions where we can just be concentrated on what we're doing with the body. It's a great um, way of um, protecting ourselves from doing anything which could possibly be harmful to ourselves or our surroundings. And you exactly watch what we're doing. Now, all that has to take place outside of meditation. The mindfulness, the attention to oneself. And you will realize that being <coughs> silent is the necessary ingredient for being attentive. And when you realize you've lost your, your attention, you've got it again. Just tell yourself what's going on. And you will see how much the mind can do. It can do so many things which are totally unnecessary. And that's why we get so tired, even when we haven't done anything physically. Because the mind is constantly chewing away at something. So our immediate benefits of the most unconcentrated meditation are making good karma, antidote against loss and torpor, seeing our thought patterns, 
through labeling, not believing any of that, but realizing that it's totally impermanent and substituting the thinking with the attention on the body, on the breath, and the purification which comes from that and the learning of being in the moment. Being in the moment is the one thing that protects oneself from all worries and sorrows. Being in this one moment most people hardly ever, if ever, experience it. They think about what's going to happen in the future, they think about what happened in the past, they worry about the future, there are so many things to worry about. One can make long lists what one can worry about. But to be in this one moment is such a relief and such a beautiful happening that it should really work at that. We've all probably experienced it at one time. It's all joyful if we don't think about the future and the past. Try it out and see it for yourself, whether it is or it isn't. The joy that we can experience in the meditation is all based upon this sort of really concentrated attention. When we do and are attentive enough, then eventually there comes the time when the mind no longer plays games and forgets about its tricks. It's a very tricky mechanism, the human mind. And as long as we believe everything we think, we also think we own it. And none of that is really true. These are our immediate benefits. And when we have these immediate benefits, we will see that they are cumulative. Day after day, there is some sort of change. Now, there are two things I need to say from a practical standpoint. The first thing is, what we're going to do in the meditation, which will only take a moment. We will use the breath as it goes in and out of the nostrils for our meditation subject. Those of you, of course, who have meditated with me before and are able to do the meditative absorptions, well, just go ahead and do it, unless you need a bit of a um, starting point to get going again. But if you can do it, just do it. But those of you who haven't, breath, as it comes in and out of the nostrils. And those of you who need a support system for the concentration, I'll mention five different ways of supporting the concentration. One is counting, which of course any of these support systems we can let go after some time when we don't need them anymore. But we may need them to get started. One on the in-breath, one on the out-breath, two on the in-breath, two on the out-breath, no further than ten. Every time there is a disturbing thought, back to one. Otherwise the mind is going to make up stories, was I at four? No, I must have already been at eight. Or maybe it was already ten and uh, I really can concentrate. Look at me, I've been at ten. So uh, none of this is necessary. Just going back to one, nobody knows about it anyway. <laughs> so we don't have to pretend or you know, be anything special. If we don't like numbers, we can use a word. We can use a word or two words, peace on the in-breath, love on the out-breath. We can 
make up a word that we like, any kind of word, uh, but short words are the best. So we can use peace on the in-breath and peace on the out-breath, that's also good, whatever we like. We can also make up one and choose it. If we are visually inclined, but only then, if we see our thoughts in pictures anyway, then we can use a visual image. If we're not that way inclined, we are just adding another burden to the concentration. So if we can, uh, if we always see pictures, it's nothing um, uh, to be recommended. It's just the way that some minds work. They just see pictures. Then we can use an ocean wave, for instance. An ocean wave that's really deep blue with um, white foam on top that brings in the uh, breath and takes it out again. It's rhythmic and for those people who are visually inclined it can be very helpful to get the concentration going. The next possibility, the fourth one, are sensation. The sensation of the breath at the nostrils We can go further in the nose, in the uh, forehead, wherever we feel it, in the throat. We don't look for the sensation. Where we feel it, we notice it on the in and the out breath. These are only support systems so that the mind has it a little easier to stay with the breath. That's all. The breath is the main subject. These are support systems. For those of you who have meditated, much, uh, quite a bit already and need to get a good start again, it's helpful to watch beginning, middle, end of the breath. That's a good way for those of you who have meditated for some time because it takes a fair bit of mindfulness. We don't say beginning, middle, end, it's much too long those words, the uh, breath is much too fast for that, but we can say one, two, three, but we don't need to say a thing. Watching beginning, middle, end of the breath, the only difficulty that people usually have is becoming aware of end and beginning again. But as we become a little more mindful and have practiced maybe sometime, that too is quite noticeable. So that's the fifth possibility, pick one. And unless your concentration doesn't need it. And then stay with the one you have picked let's say until after breakfast tomorrow and then if you don't like the one you've picked then take another one number word picture sensation beginning middle end these are the five possibilities there are far more in the scriptures but it gets too complicated five is enough to choose from I can assure you It's not the fault of the method that you may not be concentrated. It's the nature of the human mind. It's the nature of the untrained human mind. In Pali, meditation is called bhavana. And bhavana means training of the mind. Pali, the language the Buddha spoke. Just, that's all it means, training of the mind. So, and it is also... Meditation is not only training of mind, but it's also science of mind. It's repeatable, it's explainable, and it goes the same way for everybody, if one practices. So that's as far as the breath goes. Now I'd like to say something about the walking meditation, which you will also be doing tomorrow morning. And we have allocated half an hour for that. It's very useful. First of all, it's useful because one can stretch one's legs. Well, that's useful. But it's also useful because we do a lot of walking in our everyday life and if uh, and body movements. And if we actually become aware of the walking and the walking meditation, we may be able to translate and transfer that into the daily living of body movement. Body movement is one of the most used things that we do 
and as you become aware of it you will see that it's happening practically all the time body movement is intentional and also very often just impulsive both need to be watched I've already talked about that outside of meditation the walking meditation helps us walking meditation means that you pick a walking path about 20 to 25 paces long anywhere outside if the weather remains as it is outside will be the best place to do it if you do it on grass it is very helpful to do it barefoot if you're not too cold you can do it with shoes on of course too barefoot helps one to become more aware of the actual touch sensation but it can be done with shoes it's entirely up to you on that walking path please don't intersect with another person that's disturbing for both of you always go parallel to another person and there's so much room here we don't have to disturb each other and we uh, use preferably a six point attention on the walking movement and I'll explain that there are two movements to raise the foot the first thing is to raise the heel first we raise the heel then we raise the whole foot so there are two movements just to get the foot off the ground then the foot goes up in the air and then it goes forward in the air so we have two movements in the air then the heel goes down and then the foot goes down so you've got six and you can count one, two, three, four, five, six if you only wind up with five it's okay next time you might find six it's again, it's, I'll just say it once more one, two, three, four, five, six it's helpful because it is minute mindfulness the more minute mindfulness becomes the less problems we have on all levels the one way for the purification of beings is mindfulness the Buddha's words to be there now in the walking meditation eyes stay open they go down they automatically go in front of the foot so that there's no disturbance through the movement don't look around because that's disturbing eye contact with the scenery takes away the concentration down the hands should be together in front or in the back so they don't dangle and as you come to the end of the walking path you are aware also of the turning around and going back and again of the turning around and if you find the six point attention difficult you can do it three point it doesn't have that minute attention but it's also a good start so with we, what we do with that is raise the foot then put it in the air and get it down so it's raising up and then down it's a three point <coughs> attention you can count one two three you don't have to count you can just be aware now when in meditation you find that you're getting sleepy immediately open the eyes and look at the light you can pull your earlobes you can rub your cheeks you can give yourself a pep talk and if nothing helps nicely and slowly and quietly stand up most people can't sleep standing up and once you've stood up and become awake again you can quietly sit down again without disturbing your neighbor too much it's a waste of time to sleep in meditation sleep is reserved for being in bed and that also is not such a wonderful thing I mean we do need it we do have to sleep at night but uh, since most people die in bed it's uh, no use trying to foster that any more than necessary so the best the, probably the biggest help you can get is giving yourself a pep talk this is a time to meditate 
this is a time when everything has been arranged for me the whole place is arranged for my meditation there's a teacher there there are companions there on the path I don't have to do a thing the, the food is being uh, made for me I should at least try to meditate or anything anything you want to tell yourself whatever it is that will be helpful sometimes it isn't even being asleep in the meditation it's drowsiness it's sort of the mind just goes around and uh, it doesn't focus it doesn't sleep it's quite pleasant actually don't allow it take it away from that drowsy a pleasant state and put it with mindfulness on the meditation subject keep it there every time it wanders bring it back it's like an untrained puppy dog if you are very unkind to that puppy dog it isn't going to really learn anything if you're too lenient it won't learn anything either you have to find a fine balance to train that untrained puppy dog you have to bring it back to where it's supposed to be and tell it over and over again now come on do it and do it right it's the same with our mind we have to tell it nicely pleasantly lovingly but determined when you sit down make a determination not an achievement syndrome a determination I'm sitting down to meditate to get concentrated I will label all the disturbing thoughts I will label everything that comes up that doesn't belong to the meditation that's not result thinking but determination to do what you want to do if you find that you cannot possibly stay on the breath either because the mind's too sleepy or the mind's too agitated either way then don't stay on the breath to become calm but see the impermanence of each breath watch the impermanence of each breath and from that watching of impermanence of each breath you may also be able to see the impermanence of everything else that's happening the same with walking meditation you can't get concentrated on the movement see the impermanence of each movement and realize that it was if it wasn't impermanent we'd certainly not be a human being we'd be a corpse it's got to be impermanent and the same <clears throat> with the breath if it wasn't totally impermanent each breath we'd be dead in 2 minutes if that if it's necessary if the mind's either too sleepy or too agitated use that as a alternative as the mind comes down you being further away from what you usually do it will be easier to use the calm meditation one more thing you will have sometimes for individual meditation the people who do selfless service in the morning will have the individual meditation in the afternoon and vice versa those that do the selfless service in the afternoon have individual meditation in the morning so when you have the individual meditation which is one hour do it the more you, you do of it the easier meditation becomes don't look for comfort look for spiritual development california is renowned <laughs> everywhere it's nice and easy this isn't nice and easy it isn't supposed to be nice and easy it can't be all the nice and easy things you've all done <laughs> probably all been surfing you've all been uh, uh, swimming you've all had sun baths you've all had trips you, you've all had partners i mean you've done it 
So now what? This isn't the same thing. This is difficult. And because it's difficult, one has to make up one's mind that one really wants to do it. It's not far to the beach from here. I suggest you don't go. <laughs> it's a drawback to this place. Don't. You've all seen the beach. Is there anybody here that hasn't seen a beach? <laughs> You've all stuck your toes in the water. You've all been in it, in the ocean. This is different. Make it different for yourself. See that there's something else in life that has nothing to do with personal, physical comfort. It has to do with letting go of sense contacts and contacting one's inner being. That's what it's all about. Of course, if you feel, and that happens, that at this particular point in time, which whatever time that may be, the mind just refuses. It doesn't want to concentrate. Okay, go and sit on a bench somewhere and uh, just become aware of the touch contacts, of sitting, or become aware of seeing and watch what happens. It's possible. But if none of this is happening, and sometimes the mind does have this short circuit where it can't concentrate for a short period of time. What we'll have here in the hall is we'll have a bell after half an hour, a little uh, bell, after half an hour of the individual meditation where you can stand up and stretch your legs or go out or come in. You don't come in when you feel like it. You either come in at the full hour or at the half hour and you come or go out. And then if you go out, you can do half an hour walking meditation and you can, as I said, if you can't concentrate, you can sit and become aware of touch contact or eye contact, seeing something and see what happens. It's very, very uh, um, interesting and it brings a lot of insight if it's done properly. We'll talk about it at, uh, more in more detail. So, the individual meditation is always coming in and going out in the full hour or the half hour. At other times, you don't. If you've missed the first coming in, come on the half hour. You can divide your individual meditation into half hour walking, half hour sitting. You can also, after half an hour, stand up, stretch your legs and sit down again. We'll have a bell after half an hour. And uh, so we are together here for only a short time. At this moment, it may seem as if it's going to be oh, so long. It doesn't matter what I do the first few days. I have so much time. You will find that the time is over very, very quickly. Time is not um, something constant. It is totally dependent upon concentration. When you're very concentrated, you will think that the bell goes after you just sat down. If you are not concentrated at all, you think the person who is supposed to ring the bell has fallen asleep. <laughs> it's a matter of concentration. Time is not um, the same for everybody. So we will see that that is um, important to use your time well. What we'll do now, we'll stand up and stretch our legs and then uh, we'll do a short meditation, half an hour.